pop up in a second. Is Lynn on the? No, I anticipate him popping on. I mean, he's usually a couple of minutes late. Cool. Because the first case I want his, I know Dr. Mock's not available, but I'd like, and yours as well, um, your thoughts about what the learning point is. Okay, copy that. Let me know if it says, oh, it's recording now. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you guys for your time um, this morning for case reviews. We're going to go ahead and get started. <clears throat> So as always, this information is confidential and privileged as it is cases that have occurred in our county, but also um, just because of the fact that there are patient encounters. Um, it's protected against, or it's protected by HIPAA and any use of it, distribu distribution or copying of it is prohibited. So moving on to case one. I don't think it matters if he catches the first part of it. So this is a case of a 60 year old who had contacted EMS for a shortness of breath. <clears throat> um, he is, uh, this picture is supposed to represent his body habitus. He was reported to be 600 to 700 pounds. Um, they found him awake. His airway was open, but he was tachypnic. He was otherwise pink, warm and dry, but there were multiple areas documented by EMS that was concerning for potential cellulitis of his body. Uh, vital signs were obtained four minutes into the encounter. They noted that his heart rate was 174, blood pressure of 110 over 66, a respiratory rate of 26, and a room air sat of 90%. Um, the weight discrepancy is what the patient reported, where the other agency had reported that he had a known history of 700. His past medical history besides his obesity was AFib, um, and it was paroxysmal AFib, um, not always in it. The medications that he was prescribed was cardia, doxazosin, and let me rephrase that. For the past medical history, it's what EMS documented was AFib. His medications included cardia, doxazosin, flecainide, furosemide, metoprolol, hydroxazine, potassium, and tramadol. So clearly more, med more medical problems, but um, that's what we have documented. And then the history of the present illness was that the patient stated around 1 p.m. he had a sudden onset of shortness of breath and that he's had episodes like this in the past and they've been related to his tachydysrhythmia. So he contacted 911 about two hours after the onset of his symptoms at 1506 is when we made patient contact. Um, it's noted in the documentation that he was poor in hygiene in that much of his skin was ulcerated, weeping, and consistent with cellulitis. They documented that he was grossly obese, and the physical exam um, documentation was that his breast sounds were clear to auscultation. Um, the vital signs four minutes into the encounter were notable for tachycardia, normal tension, tachypnea, and a room air sat of 90, so they placed him on six liters nasal cannula. At some point, they got a blood glucose because it's only in the documentation, not in the procedures. So his sugar was 154. And they got a 12 lead within seven minutes of patient contact, which shows this rhythm. Um, <clears throat> lots of artifact, but ultimately you can de determine that he's narrow complex, tachycardia, irregular, and um, you can't really sp speak to much of his uh, precordial leads until or his limb leads until you really get into his precordial leads uh, because of his artifact, but what appears to be no ST elevation. Um, and I would call this AFib with RVR, rapid ventricular response. At 14 minutes, they attempt IV access. Um, two attempts are, are uh, unsuccessful. The third attempt is successful with a 22 gauge in his left index finger and they administered miraculously 700 mLs of lactate ringers during the encounter through that finger. At 16 minutes, they contact for bariatric unit and they get another set of vital signs. He's still um, tachycardic at 191. Now his blood pressure is 
94 over 65. They don't record a respiratory rate and his SATs are 88%. So they administer 20 milligrams of diltiazem. Um, at 20 minutes, they contact online medical control because there was no response. And the vital signs that are in bold is because they weren't actually in the vital signs section. They were just documenting the narrative. So um, he uh, he had a heart rate of 170 at that time, a blood pressure of 84 over 60, and a respiratory rate of 26. Uh, online medical control recommended that they cardiovert the patient. Another 12 lead was obtained at 28 minutes, which much better quality, but confirms your AFib with RVR. Uh, potential some ischemic changes, but that might be rate related, no evidence of ST elevation. At 35 minutes, they record another set of vital signs. He's a little more tacky at 201. His blood pressure now is 102 over 67. No respiratory rate recorded, and his stats are 93% on that supplemental oxygen. At 40 minutes, they get another set of vital signs, and they administer, which is largely unchanged. Well, I guess I shouldn't say largely unchanged. Now his blood pressure is 81 over 36. Um, which was previously 102 over 67, and he receives 2.5 milligrams of Versed for pretreatment for his cardioversion. At 41 minutes, he's cardioverted at 100 joules unsuccessfully. At 42 minutes, he's cardioverted at 150 joules unsuccessfully. And at 44 minutes, he's cardioverted at 200 joules, also unsuccessful. He remains in AFib with RVR. Transport's initiated at 62 minutes. I think that had to do with the time for the bariatric unit to arrive. And at 64 minutes, his heart rate is recorded at 141. Blood pressure is improved at 110 over 70. And his SATs are recorded at 91%. Another set of vital signs are recorded at 73 minutes. Um, he's still in the 140s. His blood pressure is 104 by PALP. And his SATs now are 94%. And at 76 minutes, they arrive to the hospital. Um, So in reviewing this case, um, I thought that the crew did a great job of getting a 12 lead early. Our goal, remember, is less than 10 minutes for a cardiac uh, case, but I think the sooner the better so that we can determine what the most appropriate uh, management for that patient should be, as well as getting a set of vital signs, which this crew did. Um, they ended up using that 22 gauge. Uh, you may want to consider an I.O., um, this guy's body habitus may be particularly difficult to push to the tibia or the humerus, um, but it would be potentially a better point of access if we had a little larger bore than that 22 gauge in his distal uh, finger. Um, but they got access nonetheless. Uh, serial 12 leads and then consideration for online medical control prior to just going to cardiovert as it appears that this patient was somewhat stable despite his hypotension and that getting some guidance on what would be the most appropriate would is is perfect or not an issue. Um, that deltaism is going to make him more hypotensive. So when they contacted online medical control, he was hypotensive. So pursuing another medical management may have caused him to become exceedingly hypotensive. So that's another great point of contacting online medical control. And then they were great at documenting difficulties on scene be between um, needing another ambulance there and then also difficulty in getting him out because of the confinement um, in, within his home. Areas for improvement. Um, in the vital sign recorded area, there was only one respiratory rate recorded throughout that encounter. And I put in a second respiratory rate because it was in the narrative. So make sure we document in our vital sign area um, as opposed to in our narrative for our vital signs, um, especially if we don't have a lot recorded in the vital signs section for that parameter. And then um, Same point is that any care or the results to or the response to care should be in our procedures and our vital signs, and it shouldn't be solely in our narrative. The reason why is that if we review these cases, um, looking at our data and our response to treatment, if it's in the narrative, we won't have that information to share and to improve our ourselves. If um, we can't look it up by the means that we usually do, which is running the running those discrete factors as opposed to running each narrative.
So patient follow-up um, in the emergency room, he was noted to be mildly or borderline um, febrile at 99.8. His heart rate was 171. His blood pressure um, upon arrival is 110 over 87. His respiratory rate of 32 in his SpO2 on nasal cannula oxygen was 90%. Because of his shortness of breath, um, he was placed on BiPAP. They attempted to manage his condition with diltiazem and IV fluids. Uh, they stopped the drip of diltiazem because he became hypotensive again at 84 over 65. They got a chest x-ray that showed possible infiltrate, so they upgraded him to sepsis based off of the chest x-ray, his initial vital signs, and the results of his labs, which showed an elevated white count and an elevated lactate. They treated him um, for potentially pneumonia. And they consulted cardiology for some guidance on how to manage his AFib, given the EMS um, management and their response to um, deltaism for this patient. The patient uh, was given digoxin, which led to further improvement in his rate control. During his hospitalization, they determined they decided that he probably wasn't having pneumonia for his uh, bacterial infection, but they attributed his sepsis to his cellulitis. They changed his antibiotics to treat that more appropriately, and they thought that his AFib with RVR was more likely in response to his sepsis, um, and that was why it was maybe more difficult to manage because of the fact that he had this underlying condition, his infection that was driving his tachycardia and his underlying irritable heart led him to be an AFib. Um, so they managed his arrhythmia and his rate with beta blockers. They started him on Eliquis for his paroxysmal AFib since he was not on any blood thinners previously, and they remained um, managing him with digoxin. He was found to be in systolic heart failure upon presentation, so they diuresed him further with Lasix and Diamox, and his blood cultures never grew out any bacteria. Um, from the chart, he was discharged back home. <clears throat> Let me see if, is Dr. Whitmer on this call now? That's okay. So I thought this was a great case to um, talk about a few things. One of the things is that it can be difficult when we have an arrhythmia, either if we have an arrhythmia because the patient has permanent um, a permanent arrhythmia such as AFib or if the, the patient is in a new arrhythmia and we're trying to determine what came first, the chicken or the egg. Was it, was it their sepsis that led them to tachycardia and for them to necessarily, um, necessarily uh, develop this um, abnormal rate or was the was the arrhythmia the source? So when you're kind of in these situations where you're you've got um, competing issues going on, you know, you and your patient is stable, and you think that this person might be infected or some other etiology for their presentation besides just the rate and the rhythm that you're looking at, you can always try managing what you think the major problem is. So for this patient, the consideration could be that we're going to. Um, he's got obvious signs of infection, maybe give him some fluid, see if his rate improves. But I think that we have the luxury, obviously, in the hospital setting is that if we manage um, the what we think is the primary problem and the secondary problem, the arrhythmia or the tachycardia don't improve, then we have the option to go ahead and start managing that second component. Um, obviously, our timeframes in the pre-hospital setting are much shorter. So I'm not faulting this crew at all for um, their decision making. And it's just another example of maybe why this patient was so refractory to, to their management. But the other thing that was also going on with this patient is that they may have been refractory to management, especially the cardioversion component based off of the patient's body habitus. So the next couple slides is based off of um, how we can improve our uh, success with cardioversion when we have an unstable patient. And I'm not an electrical engineer, so hopefully this uh, slide in my explanation makes sense. But either way, um, cardioversion is delivering energy in the form of joules in that the energy transferred, the equation is charge times current times resistance. Um, the current I have bolded is because that's the portion that actually leads to defibrillation of the heart. 
and that the current is a is effect the is the energy affected by resistance and time. And so as you increase resistance, you decrease the current to the heart in our setting, which leads to less likely to cardiovert them um, successfully. So <clears throat> the lower the impedance or resistance, the higher the current that's delivered. And it's another way of saying that. And things that increase the resistance um, is going to be whenever the patient's diaphoretic, if there's poor pads of skin coverage or uh, contact, if the patient has a large body habitus, um, such as obese, and if they're barrel chested. So it sounds like that you also can see this problem with our COPDers, and that we know based off of these things increasing resistance to the um, the current that obesity is associated with a higher cardioversion failure. So I found this, this um, study. It was a randomized control study um, that was published in 2019 in cardiovascular electrophysiology. I thought this was a great um, study to kind of talk a little bit about what they found. So they were looking at does paddles or patches work better in the obese patients that have um, per, uh, per, um, permanent AFib or not, I guess permanent AFib that needs cardioversion? And they used a biphasic monitor for delivery. So they looked at patients greater than 30 um, BMI and they had to be in AFib and they either randomized them. Actually, they didn't randomize them. They allowed the uh, individuals to either use adhesive patches or to use handheld paddles. And then they monitored what the shock vector was. So if it was anterior poster, posterior or anterior apical, apical um, placement of the, of the shock. And that the first two shocks at 100 and 200 joules failed. If the first two shocks of 100 and 200 joules failed, then they did 200 joules using whatever that they hadn't used previously. So if they were adhesive patches, they got um, they got crossed over to handheld paddles, and if they were handheld paddles, they got crossed over to adhesive patches. Um, they didn't change the vector, so they just monitored what the vector was, the AP or A, um, AA uh, modality. And they enrolled 125 patients into this study over a couple of years. They found that the first and second attempt success with patches was 68% and with paddles was 90%. And that obviously, my understanding is we only have uh, patches. And I honestly, in the pre-hospital setting, and I honestly don't think that we even use paddles as an option in the hospital setting, but that might be different at Legacy Salmon Creek. The 20 um, patches to paddle crossover and they had 20 patches to paddle crossover and six paddles to patch crossover. Ultimately, they found that paddles were more successful in cardioverting our obese patients at 82% and then with patches, which was 66.7%. They found that the shock vector that was administered didn't matter um, significantly and that if the, if the resuscitation team used a manual pressure augmentation, that 80% of all patients that had to um, go down the manual pressure augmentation, so they failed both paddle or patch, actually they failed both patch and paddle, then they would do the manual pressure augmentation. And of the of those other failures to manual pressure augmentation, 80% of them were successfully cardioverted, um, but they all were admin, they were all defibrillated at 360 joules. So you may wonder what manual pressure augmentation is. And so manual pressure augmentation is what it sounds like. You manually put, apply pressure to the chest, um, preferably over the paddles, to decrease the resistance. So either you you know you can think of it as that it it you want your strongest person or biggest person to press against the paddles to decrease the um, space from the chest to the heart, and also to compress the adipose tissue so that you have you reduce the um, resistance that is uh, is found with these obese patients. And they recommended using at least a glove. So they said it was safe to use just a glove, or if you didn't feel comfortable with a glove applied to the chest, then they said that you can use a dry blanket or a dry towel. 
um, to have some type of barrier between your hands and the patient, especially when they get cardioverted. They said that they recommended you know, this manual pressure against the pads, but um, also to charge and shock during the expiratory phase, which is the phase that your chest wall is going to not be as expanded. Um, they found that this was successful up to 360 joules that it was successful in not harming the, the team that was applying the pressure. And <laughs> yeah, there you are. That's right. I know, um, I've so I've been here all along. I just couldn't get my thing to turn on the uh, thing. What uh, yeah. do we? I had a question on on our index case here. Was yeah. uh, what was the what was the paddle? What was the patch application? If they recorded it, I don't know where I would find it. So I don't know if anybody on the call can speak to it. I didn't want to call anybody. I, out. I, yeah, my my guess is it was an AA application because this guy is seven hundred plus pounds. He's not, you know, you're not going to roll him very easily, and he's probably not in any condition to help out. Yeah. Um, but it, it may not be the case. At any rate, the other thing with the, you know. There's a whole lot of information now about doing the AA, uh, you know, the 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 anterior patch up, up on the right side stays where it is. But we now we, we now know that you should get that um, should get the apical uh, patch way back into the um, well, about the fourth rib, fifth rib. But back at the at the posterior um, uh, axillary line, way back there, because otherwise you don't catch the heart in between. Yeah. So I don't know if I wanted to. I was hoping that you'd be on this call to see if you would advocate for it. But I will say for myself. If I have attempted to cardiovert a patient, it's been unsuccessful. The patient is an extremist. I think that, I mean, I'd ha I probably will have a hard time, you know, convincing the nurses to do the manual pressure augmentation. So I feel like I would be the one, but I think that it's it's worth an effort if your patient is is an extremist. Um, kudos if they have a little verset on that you're going to shock them potentially the third time at this point, but. Or the second time, um, but well, yeah, and then yeah. I'd the other also thing, I'd also turn it up to three hundred and sixty. Yes, exactly. That's the point. Is that's why I I'm, put it in here is to say that yeah. they were eighty percent successful with manual pressure augmentation, but each of those seven cases were with three hundred and sixty joules, and I that know. it is yeah. safe from their studies and other studies that you can do the manual pressure at three hundred and sixty joules and not have an adverse effect to the provider doing the pressure. But obviously, if you're worried and you think you're going to be um, cardioverted with a RMT, then you make sure that ultimately the scene, the patient or the scene is safe for you, too. <laughs> so, Jackie, just a clarifying question, and I may have I may have missed this, but the manual pressure augmentation was done with. Was that done with paddles or patches or both? It didn't matter. And what they actually okay. said was that they they advocated because I looked at another study to because I, I personally wasn't familiar with the manual pressure augmentation. So I looked at another study and they physically said that you were placing your hands on the patches. Hmm. Interesting. Mm -hmm. you so trust your, trust your partners. I'd, I'd want. Yeah, I'd want somebody else to try that before I tried it. Definitely. <laughs> Uh, For the record, it's a much smaller jewel, but when the pacemaker or the defibrillator internal does is not functioning properly and they're calling to uh, calling for your help, being shocked with that is just a little zing from personal experience. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but anyways, I think that it's worth mentioning and um, it's worth considering for me when I have a. When I have, I, and I looked at our protocol, which is the next slide, um, we don't really talk about the jewels um, unless they're somewhere that I don't know. But for me, with an obese patient, I usually max out my jewels at 200 joules um, biphasic. And 
to cardiovert them because of the fact that there is a higher impedance. So the jewels, the, the jewels for cardioversion are discussed. It's in the procedure section. It's in, it's in okay. synchronized, it's in synchronized cardioversion. If you were to yeah. click on that, yeah. yeah. So, anyways, um, those are some 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 considerations. Is the presenting rhythm because of a response to something else? And secondly, if you find that your patient is unstable, and there um, there might be a reason for why you're unsuccessful in cardioverting them, either if it's the uh, patch placement, or if it's you think a higher resistance, um, you have a couple of options. If you choose not to apply manual pressure augmentation, you may want to consider shocking them during the expiratory phase uh, to, if there's a consideration for um, increase in, increased intrathoracic um, depth. So our protocol for unstable tachycardia, um, I think we probably have talked a little bit about this case long enough, but anyways, any signs of or perfusion caused by the dysrhythmia, so they're altered, they have um, vascular congestion in their lungs, they're presenting in acute heart failure, or they're um, hypotensive, and you think that they're in shock. Um, these are patients that we would look at if their heart rate's above 150, because under 150 or right at 150, we start thinking that it's a compensatory um, uh, presentation for something else. So, you're going to do your BSI, you're going to do synchronized cardioversion. If you have the time and your patient's stable enough, you could be nice enough to give them a little bit of uh, Versed. And uh, you have the option to give Versed after if you had to shock them immediately. I think that after the shock, the patient may have some choice words for you if you didn't give them Versed, but I wouldn't, I personally would just apologize instead of adding Versed after the fact. Although some people say that it causes them to have a amnesia to the event, so you can decide. And um, you can repeat cardioversion if it's refractory. And if you don't cardiovert, you always have the option for medical management, um, especially if they're stable. So amiodarone um, is an option. And if you think that your patient is in torsades, magnesium is another option. If you are successful in cardioverting, don't forget to get a 12 lead and uh, consider other reasons for why they presented the way that they did. Um, similar for our pediatrics, besides the decrease in Juul, um, Juul administration based off of their body um, presentation, and then uh, decrease the dose of the uh, sedative as well as the antiarrhythmic. Just giving my two cents, I, I'd advocate for giving the Versed ideally before, but if you can't after, I, I've had patients refuse a cardioversion that they really needed because they remembered what it was like to be cardioverted. So there, there's little downside um, to, to giving it and a lot of potential upside. Yeah. Do you have any other thoughts about this manual pressure pressure augmentation, Dr. Monk? I mean, I've... Uh, then stuff like that where you, like you take a towel and put a little pressure on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've done that before. And you um, obviously survived the shock. I'm talking to you. <laughs> yes, yes. So you're I saying that you shouldn't no, be worried about it. Any, no, I didn't feel anything. I, I mean, it would, I wouldn't make a routine practice, but I think it's a tool in the toolbox. Uh, but I, you know, I isolate myself with a dry towel. Cool. Thank you for your input as well. So the next case is a 49-year-old. Um, the EMS got called for altered mental status. They found this patient to be alert, um, that his airway was open and protecting. He presented with pale appearing skin. He was warm and dry, and there was no signs of active bleeding. At three minutes, they recorded an SpO2. Um, there were no vital signs uh, besides the SpO2 recorded within the first 10 minutes, so that is why those other areas are uh, not reported here. The past medical history for this patient is that he had a history of cocaine and alcohol abuse in that he also um, has hypertension. The medications recorded for him was baclofen, Zofran, and hydrolyzine. His wife had contacted EMS stating that he stopped taking his baclofen 48 hours ago and that, oh, he also has um, had a history of cocaine, but he hasn't been using. So... EMS documents that they found him in a crowded bedroom. They see him um, 
having his eyes open. He's not following commands. He's kneeling. His um, his knees are on the ground, and they document that he kind of leans forward, bumps his head on, I think, a blanket in front of him, and then leans back, rocks backwards, and hits his head on like a dresser or something along those lines. Um, they say that he's not following commands. His mouth is open and his jaw is slack, um, that he continues to kind of rock forward and backward, striking his head, but obviously not in um, a high force mechanism and that he's just not responding appropriately uh, to them or to pain. At seven minutes, they document giving him five milligrams of IM Versed in the site that they think he's causing harm to himself and they don't want him to cause harm to EMS. At 12 minutes, he um, is placed on nasal cannula oxygen at four liters. At 13 minutes is the first set of vital signs that are more complete. Uh, he's got a heart rate of 69, a blood pressure of 79 over 46, no respiratory rate recorded. His SpO2 on supplemental oxygen is 96%. They checked a blood glucose, which was 102, and they established an IV. And during his uh, pre-hospital encounter, they've administered one liter of IV fluids. The physical exam, they note that he's got lacerations to his head and his knees, and then he's got bruising around his eyes as well as his torso. They, at 15 minutes, get another set of vital signs. Um, now this has a stable heart rate of 65. They do not record a blood pressure. They do get a respiratory rate um, at 8, and that he's satting on that supplemental oxygen now at 97%. They place a nasal pharyngeal airway, and they start to bag him with a PEEP. At 17 minutes, they give him one milligram of Narcan. They indicate that the patient has snoring respirations and he's not protecting his airway at this at some point before they intubate him. Um, at 19 minutes, he gets another set of vital signs. His heart rate's 54. His um, blood pressure 73 over 45. His respiratory rate is recorded at 8. Sats on oxygen 97 and end title shows 47. They initiate transport at 24. Three minutes and before they leave, they notice that there's a large pill bottle of baclofen that's three quarters full. At 24 minutes, they place an eye gel. At 25 minutes, they get another set of vital signs. He has a uh, heart rate now of 73, a blood pressure 144 over 113, his respiratory rate 7, SATs on oxygen 95, and end title 44. At 31 minutes, his heart rate 68. His blood pressure is a little higher at 153 over 125, respirs of 9. On oxygen, he's 96, and end title is recorded at 49. At 32 minutes, they administer 180 milligrams of ketamine um, to facilitate ventilating him with the eye gel, and they document that they initiate spinal precautions. Um, should be more here. I don't have when they arrive to the hospital, but I believe that they arrive at the hospital like 36 minutes. So in reviewing this case, they went through the altered mental status protocol perfectly. Um, they looked at reversible causes and they managed his airway um, areas for improvement. The first set of vital signs should have been ideally earlier than 10 minutes and they um, recorded a respiratory rate during their vital signs of a zero. So if it was zero, great. But if it wasn't zero, make sure that you're not recording um, vital signs that are inaccurate. And that no point, there was no GCS recorded. Um, if this is a patient that you're worried about um, an ingestion or a lack of ingestion, I would recommend getting a 12 lead for an overdose evaluation. The physical exam that was documented was pretty minimal. So this is a person that you, re well, there were, they, they documented in the narrative, the things I pointed out to you guys in this call, but make sure that you document in your physical exam section and make sure that, especially when you've got um, an altered mental status patient that has signs of trauma, that we do a real good exam, including our neuro exam, so that we have an idea of how they presented before, especially if they deteriorate. And then if we are considering doing spinal precautions, they should be initiated early into the encounter. Can you go back? Can you go back, Jackie? Mm -hmm. 
Um, okay. Uh, so he gave they gave him 180 milligrams of ketamine for facilitate for the eye gel. Uh, was he bucking the eye gel? Was there a notification of that? And I noticed that he says o SPO2 of 96 and his blood pressure is already up a bit and uh he's got um respirations of nine so were they assisting him um yeah i mean they had an eye gel in at 24 minutes so i assume that they were assisting it's it is a little so part of it you know like as you're mentioning here about should do we need to sedate this patient and you know knowing that we recommend um, pain over sedation for post intubation eye gel or ET tube. So it's a little unclear exactly if they were just going down the protocol or if there was a concern. But I also think, you know, I didn't want to give this crew too hard of a time um, for the Versed administration because of the fact that it seems like I wasn't there and then it sounds like they thought that he was a harm. Um, but I'd love to see where we've tried other methods to either de-escalate but the other thing is that are they truly a harmful harm or are they just not cooperative so can you redirect can you put them on a backboard and keep them from you know in restraining them into the backboard and, and keep them from um not uh injuring their spine if they're worried about spinal precautions uh, so so i think well, that I, the documentation could be a little bit stronger yeah i would certainly like to know why they felt that they needed to sedate him again here you've got a guy who our main question is whether he's a altered mental status and now we've made him an altered mental status yeah more so so <laughs> yeah now if he if we if he was bucking the tube or fighting the tube or something uh then i agree yeah agree on that as well um in the emergency room, he had a GCS of four, which is hard to say if that was his primary problem or it was the Versed or the ketamine that contributed to his GCS of four. So they went forward to intubate him. Um, they pan scanned him based off of the lack of history and some signs of trauma to his head and chest. Those are all unremarkable. And his labs were significant for both a respiratory and a metabolic acidosis. His pH was low at 7.09. He was in acute renal failure, but normal potassium. And his liver enzymes are elevated. He had an anion gap for those that um, are savvy about that. Uh, they tried to resuscitate him with IV fluids, which were unsuccessful. So they ended up giving him norepi and they placed a central line. Um, during his hospital admission, he was tested widely for differential given his presentation. And he came back with um, toxic alcohol uh, value of acetone being elevated above the normal range we shouldn't be seeing acetone so he probably had uh, consumed some acetone as well and that his hospital course he had presented circulatory shock um, they were able to manage his shock and uh, remove all pressors but his course was further complicated by his withdrawals so he required high doses of benzos he had a withdrawal seizure during his his presentation um, on Saturday, they reintubated him because of his withdrawal or yeah, with his withdrawals. And I didn't check since Saturday what his most recent encounter or most recent progress is, but he's been admitted for at least 21 days um, since he was dropped off at the emergency room. So I thought it might be good to talk. Well, one, baclofen withdrawal. Um, we, if we're going to see a patient presenting like that, they're going to be presenting as either agitated, confused, maybe hallucinating. They might have a seizure. They would be hyperthermic or potentially increased spasticity. So kind of like increased tone, and increased um, um, reflexes kind of. But we're going to talk about isopropyl alcohol instead as, as opposed to baclofen. So isopropyl alcohol or isopropanolol um, that comes in the form of uh, rubbing alcohol or 75 percent is the per 75 percent is the most common uh, presentation to purchase it but you can get it in more higher in higher concentration at like this bottle up here in the upper right at 99 percent we use it 
to as rubbing alcohol or as hand sanitizer, but it also comes commercially for solvents um, and also for uh, pharmaceuticals. Unintentional exposures are typically going to be pediatrics, but also uh, you can see an unintentional unintentional exposure for people that are applying it to their skin in large quantities that can cause them to overdose on that. In that it's more intoxicating than ethanol, so it's much more successful in getting the the um, job done if you're using it in place of alcohol. Um, it this picture here on the right lower side shows isopropanolol, um, alcohol dehydrogenase works to break isopropanolol to its next form, which is acetone. And acetone is not acted on with alcohol dehydrogenase. So instead of causing metabolic acidosis, it causes ketosis. Ketosis is what we see when we talk about our DKAers. So they may smell kind of fruity. This patient, as I mentioned before, had both a metabolic um, and respiratory acidosis. So there were other factors playing in his case. But if this was a straight isopropanolol exposure, he would not have an um, he would not have an acidosis. Um, he would just have an elevated ketone um, presentation. And then because of this working more effectively than alcohol, they're going to be appear more intoxicated or to or appear intoxicated. So it's like the CNS depressant. Some of the other downstream effects of um, ingestion with isopropyl alcohol is that it can lead to hemorrhagic gastritis, tracheobronchitis from aspiration. They can also have um, hypothermia or hypotension because of uh, venous vasodilation. And the management is supportive. Um, we don't we don't inhibit the enzyme because it just allows that uh, that form to be present longer. So we're just uh, giving them IV fluids, and if they're cold, rewarming them. Um, obviously, if they're presenting severely intoxicated, then they may need airway management. So in regards to our protocols for altered mental status, we are going to be looking for glucose-related problems, which our crew did in this case, and then. Uh, because he had such severe respiratory depression, they also went down the route of, is this a potential opioid overdose by giving him Narcan? And then the other protocol that was also used in this case was the behavioral emergency protocol. Um, so making sure you're seeing safe, approaching the patient, um, trying to trying to have... Uh, so. You know, I, and I imagine that this is what it's saying here as well, is that you have one person doing the talking, but you do want to have a show of presence. So you want the rest of your crew to be present, but not necessarily doing the talking to hopefully inhibit them from wanting to um, engage with you in a violent way. And then um, get your history, your physical and your exam as much as you can. Um, you can... You want to use your protocols um, regarding this condition, and if you need to, you go on to your agitated patient management. So you want to make sure that the patient isn't a danger to self or others, which is might, might be the reason why they documented the wording that they did in this narrative. And you want to use all other methods to de-escalate the situation prior to moving forward with your medical management. If the patient's psychotic and you think their, their symptoms are mild, um, you can try olanzapine orally. And that is for an adult between the ages of 18 and 65 only. Um, physical restraints, you want to use the minimum level of restraints required. You uh, want to make sure that you don't do restraints that prohibits you from being able to assess the patient um, and continuing to assess the patient. And you can use a backboard if you need to, but just not prone, uh, securing all the extremities and always monitor them, both cardiac and respiratory with the monitor, SpO2 and end tidal as soon as you're able to, and don't tighten the chest straps so tightly that they can't um, allow for chest expansion to breathe. If the patient is in moderate agitation and you think that it's more related to um, psychiatric or you're not for sure, you can use droperidol IM. And, and you can also use up to five milligrams IV, but I would 
I would pause before you go max. You can start at 2.5 to, and then go up to five. Um, may repeat every 15 minutes for a total of 10 milligrams. And then alternatively, you can use Haldol 2.5 to five IV IM may repeat up to every 15 minutes up to 10. If you think that your patient's altered mental status, behavioral problem, agitation is related to drug ingestion, withdrawal or postictal, then we advocate more for Versed use. Um, 2.5 to 5 IV or IM repeated as needed to a max dose of 10 milligrams. If 10 minutes after administration, the max dose of Draperidol, Haldol, or Versed, and the patient be remains combative, you want to try a different class. Uh, do not use Haldol and Draperidol at the, um, during this that same patient encounter. And you're only using Benadryl if the patient presents with ex extra pyramidal uh, symptoms, so not prophylactically. If your patient is severely agitated, so I think that our understanding of moderate to mild, moderate, and to severe is probably all over the board. But if your patient's severely agitated, they're diaphoretic, they're fighting, they're lunging forward, this is not a patient that's just using bad words to describe you. This is a patient that's physically in extremis. Uh, they can have Joperidol 10 milligrams IM with 5 milligrams of Versed IM to achieve and maintain sedation. sedation. And that Haldol 10 milligrams IM may be substituted over uh, Joperidol. Last protocol in this is shock. So if they, um, if you think that your patient's hypovolemic, you want to control any external bleeding, give them IV fluids up to two liters. Um, you want their systolic blood pressure to be 100 and a map above 65. If you see signs of heart failure, so uh, jugular venous distension, uh, crackles on the lung exam, you would stop uh, resuscitating in that way. Or if their ment mental status improves. Um, I'm. If you think that, I'm going to move past, I guess this patient could have qualified for head injury and shock based off of some of the signs and symptoms that they saw. So fluid challenges above target blood pressure is the same as well as the MAP, and you want to maintain their ventilation uh, rate with an end title of CO2 of uh, 35. And then if you think that the patient's either in shock because of distributive cardiac or hypoadrenal shock, um, you, well, I guess for distributive and cardiogenic, you would consider pressors norepi or epi, and for hypoadrenal shock, you can consider uh, solumedrol, but you should at least fluid challenge beforehand. All right. Any other questions or concerns about case two? Case three is a case of a 78-year-old female that was at a local restaurant. Uh, they, call, they were called out for choking. The patient was unresponsive. Um, the patient had a partially obstructed airway and she was not protecting. Uh, she was pale, warm, and dry. There was no signs of active bleeding. At four minutes, they were able to retain, obtain a heart rate of 116, uh, not able to get a blood pressure. Her respiratory rate was 40 and her SATs were 50% on room air. Her GCS was eight. She had a past medical history documented for Alzheimer's, dementia, diabetes, and Parkinson's. The meds were unknown. Um, she was eating with her family at a local restaurant when she started to choke. I believe they said a CC CCSO officer performed abdominal thrusts and they were able to partially relieve her complete airway obstruction. The partial obstruction that or the obstruction that was part that was relieved was a three centimeter piece of meat. They noted that the patient was agitated upon arrival, combative. She had audible strider. Her mouth was full of chewed food and the physical exam that is pertinent for this case is that her breast sounds were absent on the left. She had ronchus breast sounds on the right on the right and she had agonal respirations. The vital signs at four minutes I just reported to you so we'll move on to 20 um, to the other vital signs. So um, they repeated vital signs and at uh, 18 minutes her heart rate was 117, her respiratory rate was 24, her sats had improved to 66 a little bit with supplemental oxygen, or actually before supplemental oxygen. They were able to place her on a non rebreather mask at 35 liters. They started an IV. Uh, they obtained another set of vital signs, uh, heart rate 120, blood pressure 108 by palp, respiratory rate at 25, SpO2 is 55%, and her end title was 36. At that point, um, they attempted to 
try to sweep out any additional food using an OPA unsuccessful. So they moved forward with RSI. They gave her 150 milligrams of ketamine and 100 milligrams of succinylcholine. Uh, they used a McGill's to try to remove any foreign bodies, but they couldn't uh, grasp it is what they documented. They also used suction, if I remember correctly. They placed a 6.5 ET tube with a video laryngoscopy, um, and they were successful on their first pass attempt, which I wanted to show you guys. So hold on. Lots of secretions, looks like some noodles, a little bubbling coming from what would be her trachea, her, her trachea epiglottis. You can see the epiglottis kind of in the, um, right here. Little, so they document first pass. I'm assuming that they just pulled the ET tube back, not out of the mouth, but just back out of view. Some difficulty in passing it through the vocal cords but ultimately they were successful. So airway management, strong BLS and ALS um, management, they got vital signs early on. They were able to RSI her um, using video laryngoscopy and uh, first pass success they oh i forgot to finish up here um so gcs of 3t they do 100 micrograms of fentanyl and followed by 150 milligrams of ketamine another set of vital signs she's still hypotensive at 92 by palp but her heart rate's 87 uh sats now improving to 81 percent and title 69 and they arrived to the hospital so there we go um so both uh post intubation sedation was appropriate and really no major areas for improvement to discuss here uh dr mock do you want to give the follow-up since she had gone to salmon creek but i also you don't have to i can present that here uh why, why don't you go ahead it's it's been a little while since i looked at this case uh, oh yeah no problem so in the emergency room, some of it I don't know for sure, so you might be able to clarify, but um, then they got a chest x-ray. They noticed that she was right main stem, so they uh, pulled back the ET tube. They did a, I think, did the bronchoscopy happen in the emergency room or in the ICU? Yeah, I'm no, sorry. That? Yeah, now I'm remembering. Yeah, the uh, intensivist came down to the ED, did bronchoscopy because there's a little bit of uh, difficulty oxygenating, um, and they... Uh, they pulled some food out in the ED with the bronchoscope. Excellent. So she was admitted to the ICU uh, and uh, she was managed for aspiration pneumonia. She was extubated on hospital day two. They note that she was back to her baseline neurological status, that she had a history of severe oropharyngeal dysphagia, um, and that they decided that she wasn't a candidate for a feeding tube. They modified her diet and discharged her with a uh, hospice. So not a lot of groundbreaking stuff to talk to you guys about, about foreign body airway obstructions. And this case came to you by Dr. Mock as he wanted uh, a great representation of a well-managed case. Um, so mechanisms to protect against aspiration in the adults is going to be glottal closure, expiratory reflex. So um, expiratory reflex is different than a cough because it occurs on expiration where inspiratory is what is associated with a cough. Um, and it's supposed to help try to expel something that has irritated the trachea and that's potentially an obstruction or form. Uh, conditions that are associated with increased risk is anybody who has any difficulty with swallowing. So that could be a prior, prior stroke, Alzheimer, Parkinson's, 
Um, this can be acutely because of intoxication or because they have the inability to chew their food uh, from poor dentition or if they have some cognitive or developmental delay. And then obviously advanced age is a potential uh, risk factor for aspiration management, which we uh, saw in this case uh, excellently was ABCs, um, assessing their alertness um, if they're unresponsive, because uh, that does play a role in how we're going to manage these patients and doing a good physical exam. So they may have some nasal flaring, some lung re uh, rest, uh, retractions. They may have some accessory muscle use. There may be strider that's either audible or oscillated. They can be hoarse. They may have a seizure if they're unresponsive from their aspiration, um, their complete airway aspiration, and their breast sounds may be atypical, either absent or wheezing or ronchorous. And we do want to take a look in their mouth, um, not to blindly sweep, but to identify if there's something that we can pull out. Um, uh, this is all speaking for adults on the next bullet point, but abdominal thrusts, if they're awake, if they go unresponsive. If they're awake and they're full of full um, obstruction, if they're a partial obstruction, we recommend that they try to clear that obstruction. Um, once they go unconscious, we'll be doing CPR and we'll be using direct laryngoscopy to enter McGill's and potential suction to see if we can pull something out while we're doing our CPR. If the foreign body is suspected to be above the um, the uh, above the vocal cords or the cricothyroid membrane, then we might consider cricking them. But if it's below the cricothyroid membrane, then the option would be to potentially place an ET tube, push the foreign body into the um, into the the lung, which, as we know from previous teaching, it's more likely to go to the right um, main stem, and then. Once we potentially move the largest chunk out of the way to be able to aerate the lung, try to pull back to at least the level of the carina so that we're trying to ventilate both lungs. Um, if you feel like that's too cumbersome or you're afraid you're going to lose the tube, we can also try to manage this in the hospital setting. Um, if you're alone and you are choking, the options that you can do is pounding your sternum a little bit or trying to inflict a abdominal thrust by using a piece of furniture or a chair um, to kind of knock yourself down to try to force that foreign body out um, with that external pressure. And then if you're obese or if you are um, gravid from pregnancy, then it'd be more chest than it is abdominal thrust. So for our respiratory distress protocol, um, under the upper airway obstruction. Our partial obstruction, we want to have the patient sit up, have him or her cough, and transport of obstruction is not cleared or suspicious of aspiration. For complete obstruction, we want to follow the AHA protocol, um, laryngoscopy if unconscious with attempt to remove with McGill's. If obstruction is not removed and you're unable to ventilate, you would be considering cricothyrotomy or needle jet insufflation in a pediatric patient. Any other thoughts or questions? All right. Case four. Case four is a probably a pretty quick, straightforward one. 38-year-old female that EMS was called to the dialysis center. They got called for a seizure. Uh, initial vital signs in the first 10 minutes was just a GCS of five and a weight of 100 kilos. They found this patient to be responsive only to painful stimuli. Her airway was open and she was not protecting it. They noted that she was pale, cool, dry, with no active signs of bleeding. Her past medical history documented was end-stage renal disease, um, coronary artery disease, hyperlipidemia, and hypertension. The meds that were recorded for her included aspirin, atorvastatin, carvedilol, losartan, nifedipine, and hydrolyzine. The history that they got was that the husband had dropped her off for her dialysis. They didn't mention if this was her normal day to go. Um, the staff found her to be seizing in the lobby, so they picked her up, put her in a dialysis chair, and put her on her side because she was vomiting. There's a lot to report, so that's why these numbers are so small, so I'll, I'll walk you through it. This uh, call patient contact occurred at 6 o'clock in the morning. They um, started to bag her at 5 minutes. At 9 minutes, they repeat a respiratory rate assessment and end tidal rate assessment as well as a GCS, which is unchanged from nine minutes earlier, except for now they have an end title of 16. 
At 11 minutes, they attempt an IV, which was unsuccessful. At 13 minutes, they get a blood glucose of 232. At 14 minutes, she gets her full, first full set of vital signs, heart rate of 68, blood pressure of 214 over 139, respiratory rate of 9, GCS of 6, and end title of 16, and IV is established, and she's given uh, 400 cc's of IV fluids. At 15 minutes, they get their first 12 lead, and I would say that looking at this 12 lead, it's sinus and rhythm. Um, she has what does appear to be concerning T waves in most of her leads, but she also has this T wave inversion in her lateral leads. So looking at this, I'd call a sinus rhythm, um, potential hyperkalemia and potential ischemic changes in her lateral leads. Um, she also has normal intervals in regards to her QRS and her PR. They say that her QTC is 470. So here it says prolonged QT interval, but that I would interpret this as sinus rhythm, potential for hyperkalemia and lateral ischemia, and maybe some repolar, uh, ventricular repolarization based off of the amplitude of her uh, QRSs. At 18 minutes, they recheck her respiratory rate, her GCS, her respiratory rate's recorded as two, her GCS is five, her SpO2 is 38% and her end title is 20. They administer six milligrams of albuterol and 0 0.5 milligrams of atrovent. At 19 minutes, she gets another set of vital signs. Heart rate now is 70, blood pressure 112 over 140, respiratory rate of nine, GCS of five, and they administer 30 of calcium chloride. At 25 minutes, they give her eight of Zofran. At 30 minutes, they give her, or they repeat her vital signs. Heart rate still, um, in the 70s to 60s, blood pressure is still severely elevated at 229 over 130, respirs of 14. Her GCS stays as five. And in fact, I think the highest she had is six. Her SpO2 is 92% and her end title is 23. At 35 minutes, they elect to RSI her. They give her 20 milligrams of atomidate and 200 milligrams of succinylcholine. At 38 minutes, they attempt to intubate her and are successful in pl placing an ET tube on the second pass with video laryngoscopy. At 40 minutes, they give her five of her sed. And at 42 minutes, they give her 50 of fentanyl. They initiate transport at 44 minutes. And she has a couple of sets of vital signs that are obtained in the six minutes of transport to the hospital. And she gets another redose of her uh, fentanyl. So... I thought in the review of this case that the identification of hyperkalemia or recognition of hyperkalemia, because that's what their concern was. Although don't forget that calcium should be the first one that we administer and bicarb is also part of our um, hyperkalemia management. Uh, airway securement with once that, dis that decision was made and then serial EKGs, I didn't put all the EKGs in there, just, just reporting that they did reassess it, but they didn't make any changes in regards to additional med medical management um, for her hyperkalemia. And then areas for improvement, early vital sign obtain obtainment. If IO, if IV access was difficult, because you can see at 11 minutes, they um, try their first IV, then you can consider IO. Um, and then with suspected hyperkalemia, we should not be using succinylcholine because that can further um, increase the potassium, I think another 0 0.5 mil equivalents. So in the emergency room, she was found to have a potassium of 7.8 despite the management that she received in the pre-hospital setting. So that suggests that she actually was even higher prior to this value being reported. She was shifted with calcium, um, insulin, and uh, I think that she got a little dextrose because of her glucose being a little on the lower side, and she's in renal failure chronically, as well as albuterol. And then they got a CT of her head and neck. Um, I think that they did that because there was reports of her having a seizure. Her urine drug screen was positive for methamphetamines and cocaine. Um, oh, and then she did actually have a seizure, I believe, and that's why they ended up giving in the emergency room. So they gave her a gram of Keppra. Her chest x-ray was concerning for pneumonia, so she received antibiotics. She was admitted to the hospital, but she checked herself out at five days. So just a quick refresher about hyperkalemia. 
Um, it's a potassium of greater than 5.5 milliequivalents per liter. There's mild, moderate, and severe. This patient at 7.8 was a severe presentation of hyperkalemia in this, you know, when I mentioned earlier, I'm not sure if this was her normal day to dialyze, but that might be helpful, um, especially if you're on the on the border on her EKG is to see if she missed dialysis. Um, so when our body has more potassium than than ideal, it can lead to abnormal heart rhythms as well as skeletal mu muscle function. And then some of the risk factors, you know, our dialysis patients is one. So anything that's renally impaired, if the if the patient's um, having problems with uh, clearing clearing metabolites or waste products from their kidneys, so either known history of renal impairment, so they go to dialysis, they're on medications that can contribute, so beta blockers, um, ACEs, ARBs can also increase potassium levels if there's a reason for them that being acute renal failure, such as they are severely dehydrated, they've been laying on the ground for a while, there, there's burns that are greater than 48 hours, um, significant burns, not like a but you got a first degree burn from going to Jensen Beach, Jansen Beach um, a couple of days ago. And then uh, the last would be um, rhabdo or muscle, muscle uh, abnormalities such as Duchenne's. And then a reminder of the progression in regards to escalating potassium levels. So initially you'll start to see some peakness to your uh, T waves. You'll start to see some widening of the QRS as this pro uh, prolongs or progresses. And then you'll start to see that the T wave and the QRS start to look similar until eventually you get sine wave and asystole. So hyperkalemia, our protocol says is suspected in anybody who's in renal failure or is a dialysis patient. Um, those that are have a higher propensity would be people with muscular dystrophy, paraplegia, quadriplegia, crush injuries, prolonged immobilization, or burns that are serious that are greater than 40, 48 hours since they occurred. We want to get a 12 lead in that the patients can have a multitude of symptoms such as tingling, numbness, paresthesias. They could be weak. Um, the EKG changes is what we mentioned in the previous slide. And then management is going to get an IV and give them calcium gluconate first, three grams. Um, we also would be get administering sodium bicarb, mil one milliequivalent per kilogram. And then if you're out at North Country, you can repeat the calcium bicarb after 30 minutes if there are signs of worsening hyperkalemia, such as worsening bradycardia, cure risk prolongation, or if the T waves start to appear uh, peaked again. Uh, albuterol, five milligrams, continuous. You don't need the atrovent. And you can get a max um, albuterol nab of 20 milligrams, unless we only have um, the albuterol atrovent combination because of shortages. Anybody else have any questions, concerns, thoughts that they want to share about this case? Well, in summary, um, the four cases that we pre I presented to you guys today. Uh, kind of depicted here in picture form. So if your patient has in increased resistance from adipose tissue or increased intrathoracic wall um, distance, and you are potentially cardioverting this patient, uh, you may want to consider higher amounts of current to be able to, to successfully cardiovert them. And I don't know what our protocol says specifically. So if it doesn't say that you can consider 200, I would probably contact online medical control to cover your bases. You can also consider manual pressure augmentation if you are willing to um, do so. Maybe your newest person would be the candidate to push against the paddles or the patches. Um, if your patient appears intoxicated, it probably is alcohol, but other considerations um, should be considered such as toxic alcohols and acetone. Um, if you uh, know of an ingestion of isopropyl alcohol or the patient has not consumed any alcohol but are acting intoxicated and they may have um, a fruity smelling breath, but it'd probably be more of a, of a known ingestion or identified by laboratory testing. Um, choking is uh, something that happens 
for multiple reasons, um, and it's the fourth leading cause of unintentional death in adults. And then in our patients that are known to have renal failure, we should always be either known because they undergo dialysis or suspected because of the presentation. We should um, be looking for hyperkalemia and not contributing to uh, treatment that may further worsen their hyperkalemia. That is it. Thank you guys for your time and attention. Thank you, Dr. Gabor. That is actually a lot of stuff. It is. I talked a lot. I apologize. And it went over. So, all right. Thank, thank you, you guys. That was great. Thanks, Dr. Gabor. Oh, thank you. I'm looking at chat. I don't see anything in the chat.